In the name of Jesus, dear saints of God. This week, the young men in our church body who have been training and preparing and studying for the pastoral ministry will be getting their assignments, assigned to their first congregation. It's an unforgettable time, and I remember it extremely well, because this is the time that you start more vividly thinking about and pondering what your first congregation will be like. Will it be a big church or a small church? Will it be in a rural setting or an urban setting? Will you be a solo pastor or part of a larger ministry team? What will your people be like? What will their ages be, their demographics, their professions, their personalities? Will they like you? Will they support you? Will they work with you? Or will they look down on you because of how young you are and how inexperienced you are? It's an exciting time. Each congregation is uniquely challenging and uniquely blessed. Each has its own personality, their own struggles, its own opportunities, and its own vision for how that ministry in their area at that time and in that place should be carried out. I was thinking about that this week with assignment day approaching, but then as I looked at the text in front of us this week from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I started thinking about what would it be like to have been the pastor at Corinth? I think you could make the case, and many have, that the congregation at Corinth there in the first century was the most gifted and talented group of Christians that God has ever gathered into one congregation. Throughout the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, he references some of those gifts, some of those talents that they had been blessed with. And in chapter 12, the words right before our text this morning, Paul dedicates an entire chapter to addressing them. Think about this. The church in Corinth had members of their congregation who had been given by God the ability to heal diseases. And I don't mean the kind of stuff that you see on TV late at night where you go up and tap someone's forehead and they faint and fall over. No, I mean real power, real ability to do the exact same thing that Jesus did throughout His ministry. To give people who had the inability to walk, to stand up and run home. People who could not see given sight. People who had the deadly disease of leprosy made clean and whole once again. There were people in that congregation there in Corinth who had been given the gift of prophecy, meaning they could foretell, foresee, and with 100% accuracy predict the future. And no, not the kind of charlatan fortune-telling that, again, you see in the middle of the night as you're trying to fall asleep. These things really happened. God gave people these gifts. There were people in the Corinthian congregation who had been given superior knowledge and wisdom. Those who were exceedingly wealthy and influential. They had gifted speakers. And not just like really good public speakers, but they had people who could speak in different tongues, different languages, languages that might have been known, but also these, this language, or not really even a language, but a language given by God that, that people could speak and then another person could interpret to show them, look, the Holy Spirit 
is working through me. But as the saying goes, more money, more problems. And spiritually and congregationally, we could say, the more gifted the church, the more challenges you should expect. Paul also reserved some of his harshest criticism for the saints in Corinth. On the one hand, yes, every church has their own issues. This is to be expected when you're dealing with a group of sinful people, which every church is. But if you could make the case that the Corinthians were the most talented and gifted group of Christians, the most talented and gifted congregation in the history of Christianity, you could just as easily make the case that it was also the congregation most wrought with problems. Big problems. Serious problems. Every single chapter in 1 Corinthians, Paul is bringing up another problem. Another issue. But here in chapter 13, Paul addresses all of their problems in a general way. Every challenge, every problem, every issue had at its core, at its very foundation, the fact that the Corinthians lacked love. They didn't love one another, their fellow believers. They didn't love the people of their community, and it was all evident in all of the challenges and problems that they created. Here's how Paul put it. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 is arguably the most well-known chapter in the entire New Testament, largely, I think, because of the topic. It keeps saying the word love, and who doesn't love talking about love? Many of you probably even had these words read at your wedding. Maybe they were even the focus of your wedding But Paul is not talking about love in a general way, as if it's some abstract emotion. He's not even talking about the love specifically between a husband and a wife. No, Paul is talking about love as an absolute necessary characteristic of a Christian congregation. Because it is an absolutely necessary characteristic if you consider yourself a Christian. And that matters. Because love is the only commandment that God gives you. Now some of you are saying, Pastor, I know it's been a while, but the last time I checked there were ten commandments. When did you all of a sudden get rid of nine? You're right. There are ten commandments. And in fact, there are a whole lot more than that. But boil all of those commandments down, and Jesus himself does this on multiple occasions. And what command do you get? Love. Jesus says, here it is. Every commandment summarized Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is why Paul would write to the Roman Christians, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love perfectly God and everyone else around you, and you have kept every last single thing that God ever commanded you to do with your life. 
So Paul says to the Corinthians, so what if you're a gifted speaker? God doesn't command anyone to be a great speaker. You could speak every language in the history of the world with the beauty of the greatest orators in the world. You could even speak with all of the force and authority of the angels themselves if you don't speak those words in love, then all you are doing is making noise. Loud, annoying noise. Like clanging cymbals together or a resounding gong that just never seems to shut up. You could predict the future with 100% accuracy too. Wouldn't that be something? You could be the smartest person who ever walked the face of the earth with the ability to ask every single question that has ever been asked. You could have the strongest faith and, and, and all of those things could be combined and given to you and if you did not use them in loving service to your neighbor, you are nothing, Paul says. You could be the most charitable human being who has ever lived. The most generous giver the world has ever seen. You could even be willing to give up your life for what you believe in, but if none of that was driven by genuine love, then all of it would be an absolute waste. But what does Paul mean by love? <clears throat> That's kind of an important question. A word that has been so abused and emptied, it's almost meaningless today. And I kind of think that might have been the case in Paul's day too. Because we all love, right? We know what love is. We all love. We love certain people and certain things. Typically people who love us and things that make us happy. But do we love the people and the things that God expects us to love? in the way and to the degree that he demands us to love. You know, in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said essentially, so you love people who love you. Big deal. Everybody does that. Unbelievers, atheists, pagans, and heathens love people who love them. That ain't Christian love. Which means it's not the kind of love that God calls you to give. So Paul, writing here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes it crystal clear. He gives 16 characteristics of real, godly, divine love. And each one is ongoing and continuous characteristic that God expects from Christians like us 24-7, without exception. Do you want to know what love looks like? What love is? How it talks? How it acts? What it does? Paul tells you. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's it. That's all that love is. The irony is, this is the section of this most well-known chapter that everybody loves. The section that gives you the warm fuzzies and all of the aww moments. Love is kind, aww. You can just hear people saying that after every single phrase when the reality is, that's not at all what Paul intends to do with these words. No, instead, Paul writes this section 
to essentially deal one blow after another to destroy any thought that the Corinthians had if they thought that their gifts mattered to God aside from being done in and accompanied with love. Those who were gifted were using their gifts as an excuse to boast in themselves and be prideful of themselves, to be rude to others and to look down on those who weren't as gifted as they were. They used their gifts to serve themselves instead of one another, and those who weren't given any of those top-shelf gifts, well, they looked at their fellow Christians with what you would expect. Envy, jealousy, and anger. The Corinthians were known for many, many things. But God wanted them to be known for love. So what about us? What would Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Thousand Oaks, California be known for? We've got talented and gifted people, outstanding musicians and singers, excellent leaders, generous givers, people who know their Bibles, wonderful encouragers and supporters. But do we love? Do we love one another and do we love our community? Do we love like this? Is this the church that you have to go to in town if you just absolutely have to be loved? Can you imagine how much more time and energy you and I would have if we would stop wasting both time and energy on trying to figure out whether or not I should love this person in my life or that person? When the Lord God Almighty has already answered that question for every single person that you will ever meet. Yeah, Jesus, I know you want me to love everyone, but what about the person who, and he stops you in mid-question, and he asks you a question of his own. He says, consider this. Is the person you're thinking about someone for whom I have died? Then yes, I love them. And I want you to love them too. But why love? Why does God hold up love as the virtue, the characteristic of His people? Why not something like faith or, or knowledge or wisdom? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, Paul says all of those other gifts, everything else we could be known for as Christians and as a congregation, everything that Christians take pride in and value over love, Paul says eventually they're all going to end. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When perfection comes, when Jesus returns, when the fulfillment of all things finally arrives, then everything like prophecies and tongues and wisdom will have served its purpose and they will be done away with. There will be no need for prophecies in heaven because every last promise that your Lord has ever made to you will right there in front of you be kept and realized. There will be no need for tongues. As we just sang earlier, with one voice, we will gather around the throne of the Lamb and we will sing His unending praises. This need to grow in knowledge and wisdom will be done. Paul compares it to the transition from being a child to being an adult. 
Think of all of the things that you needed to learn as a child that you don't need to relearn or even really think twice about these days. How to tie your shoes, how to walk, how to do any number of things. Paul makes the comparison that just as that transition happened in your life from child to adult, he says, so that transition will happen when you enter into glory from child to adult, from child to full maturity. And everything that you knew, everything that you thought you knew, all of that will be enhanced and perfected. What we know about God now is revealed to us in His Word by His Spirit. Paul says it like this, Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The Holy Spirit reveals to us who God is and we see Him with the eyes of faith. But what we see is is imperfect because of our fallen nature. It's warped. It's sort of like Paul is envisioning that between us and God there is this giant wall. And so we cannot peer into the face of God. But God puts this mirror at the ceiling. And up looking at that mirror, we can see this reflection of who God is. Only it's not like a real mirror, like a mirror that you and I see. Because, well, those mirrors almost give you a perfect reflection of what you're looking at. The word that Paul uses here is like a polished piece of metal. You could still get a pretty good idea, a general picture, but it's not going to be perfect and it's going to be warped. It's not the real thing. We can see some features of God right now, but there's no way that we are near to making out the full picture. But Paul says the day is coming. The day when that barrier will be removed. And we will see God face to face, Paul says. And unlike Isaiah and unlike Moses, there will be absolutely no fear of that face undoing you. No. There you will see that face perfectly, with perfect eyes, and you will see it once and for all the way it was always meant to be seen. The face of God will be your life, and your light, and your love. Which is the second reason why God holds up love for us. Because God is love. Think about it. The scriptures do not tell us that God is wisdom, or that God is grace, or that God is mercy even, Although God is absolutely wise, gracious, and merciful, but it does tell us that God is love. And so hidden behind these words which convict us, these words that remind us of just how unloving we are, behind these words is also the most beautiful and loving picture of who your God is in Christ. God is patient and kind. The Lord is long-suffering with us. He endures with us for a lifetime longer than He should. Christ does not envy or boast of Himself, and He is not too proud to identify with sinful people like you and me. He is not rude or self-serving, but always only lives to serve you. He is not easily angered. He can't be. Otherwise, you and I would be done. He keeps no record of wrongs. The God who knows and hears and sees all things in your life has no record of your sins. They have all been forgiven 
forgotten forever, nailed to his cross, buried in his tomb, washed away in baptism, removed from you as far as the east is from the west. He does not delight in evil, and so neither do we. But he does rejoice in the truth, and so do we. God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. God never fails. In other words, God is never inadequate. He is never insufficient. He never stops blessing you. He never ceases to be present with you. He never fails you. So why love? Because God is love. And so whenever we share or express love, we draw closer to and reflect more clearly our God and Father who is love. Which is why Paul concludes with this. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Paul is not ranking these in matter of importance. Neither is he saying that faith and hope will be gone forever in heaven. I mean, the way that you and I picture and have faith and hope right now, yes, that will be changed and that will be done away with because we won't need to believe anymore that which we do not see because in heaven, of course, we will. But faith is trust and in heaven we will trust more perfectly than we have ever known. And we will hope every single day our hope will be fulfilled and answered. But love, love is what both faith and hope lead to. It's what both faith and hope drive toward. It is the whole reason why God has given you and blessed you with faith and hope. So that you would love so that you would know that you are loved. So he sends his Spirit to bring you to faith and strengthen you in hope because he wants you to be loved. And he places you in a congregation filled with other people that he calls to love you. Brothers and sisters, this congregation has been so richly blessed by God's grace And I am very fortunate to be your pastor. It is overflowing with talented and gifted people. But more than anything, God calls us to be a congregation of love. And how could we not be? God is love. Our God is love. And you? You are the objects of that love his heart's greatest desire. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.